Well, thanks again, everyone. I think this really does dovetail nicely with what Grace was just talking about. Um, and as Jenna mentioned, I'm a social scientist at NOAA Fisheries, where I've been for about five years. I'm here based out of Honolulu. I'm currently sitting in the Ahupua'a of Kulio'o. And prior to NOAA, I worked for just over a decade with the National Park Service in the Natural Resource Stewardship and Science Directorate. And I worked on human dimensions of wildlife management. So I'm gonna walk you through the evolution of our work that started at the National Park Service with Sarah Molina, um, one of my co-authors, and that Sarah and I have both continued in collaboration with Katie Abrams, who's the other co-author in the Department of Journalism and Media Communication at Colorado State University. And then I just also wanted to mention that my master's degree was in wildlife ecology and conservation with a focus on animal behavior. So that's what you'll see at the beginning of the talk. And then my, my dissertation and main work function at the Park Service were also in applied social science related to wildlife management. So that, that's why there's such a heavy um, foundation in the wildlife terrestrial side of things. Um, but for both NOAA and the National Park Service, like many agencies that protect wildlife, there's this concern about recreation and wildlife disturbance, which is why you're all gathered, right? Um, so on the one hand, these safe wildlife viewing opportunities are often part of the visitor experience that managers seek to provide. It's actually in the mission of the Park Service. Um, on the other hand, without proper management, recreational activity can cause changes in animal behavior that can seem cute, you know, but they can also be dangerous to both wildlife and people. And so as you can see in this historic Park Service photo, managers have been addressing these challenges pretty much as long as there have been visitors to protected areas. Jeff Marion recently summarized visitor impacts to wildlife as illustrated in this figure, um, which shows the role of recreation disturbance to animal behavior changes that can affect not only individual animals, but also to populations and communities. And in the National Park Service, I first got involved in this discussion when all of the regional wildlife biologists were really expressing concern about wildlife habituation, which is when animals were getting so used to people and human infrastructure that it was leading to these potentially unsafe situations. And so these photos give you a sense of some of these concerns, like the elk at Grand Canyon, the bears at Cades Cove in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, or wild horses at Assateague National Seashore. So we started by looking at some of the core principles of animal behavior, just real basics, you know, that animals respond to stimuli, which can have consequences. Repeated exposure to a stimulus with the same consequences can result in learning. Learning is a natural process and that's how animals adapt to their environment and that this happens at the individual level. So what this looks like, one example um, through habituation is when a stimulus has neutral consequences and the animal's response to that stimulus wanes over time. So instead of running away from people, like the elk in this photo, once uh, the elk become habituated, they learn that people are harmless and then they stop reacting. Another example is conditioning. When the stimulus has a consequence and the animal's response strengthens over time. So in this case, the elk in the campground learns that people are a source of food and they may start to actively seek out people to get that food. And we found it helpful to graphically visualize a behavior change process, which demonstrates, again, that habituation and food conditioning are really fundamentally different learning processes. And so when you put it on an axis, this axis reflects that there are really three potential overt responses to a disturbance. There can be no reaction, the animal, the animal can move away or avoid the disturbance, or move towards it, become attracted to it. And then over time, as the animal is exposed to that same stimulus over and over, that response may change due to learning. And so when the stimulus has neutral consequences, that's when the animal learns there's no benefit from reacting and the response weakens. So this can be from either direction. So a waning attraction or an avoidance response. And managers tend to be more concerned about animals losing their fear of people. So that's that on the bottom going up. And these are idealized curves just for illustration purposes. They're not exact slopes. The slopes might be different for different um, species and contexts, but it gives you a sense of the, how this process works. And then when the stimulus has either positive or negative consequences, the animal learns to either avoid that stimulus or be attracted to it. And managers here tend to be more concerned about animals seeking out food rewards. Um, and they want to use the negative conditioning as a way to prevent animals from interacting with people. 
So when you put these concepts together, it looks like there's this one continuum of escalating behavior change. But again, it's really those two different learning processes. So on the bottom left, you see what's sort of assumed to be the natural or desired wild condition when the animals are running away, away from people. And this makes sense, right, in a situation um, where um, animals have evolved with people as hunters, as predators, basically. But in a protected area context, animals learn that people aren't threatening, and that's when they start to lose that flight response and become habituated. And so while this is where it can lead to some great wildlife viewing opportunities, it can also affect how people think about animals and how they think it's appropriate to interact with them. And then further, once animals and people come closer together, it becomes easier for animals to accidentally get that food reward and start learning to associate people as an easy sort of source of food, leading to attraction and food conditioning. And this is often when that potential for dangerous, inter dangerous interactions happens where individual animals might need to be put down. So just a couple other things to keep in mind. As I mentioned, managers tend to want to use negative conditioning to prevent this escalation using things like rubber bullets or bean bags or noisemakers or other scaring devices. But animals can habituate to those tactics. And then further, once they get a food reward, they might learn to ignore those scary sounds or those bean bags to get that reward. And then also there are often way more visitors giving those positive rewards than managers giving the negative reward. So it's very easy for animals to kind of get into that food condition situation if we're not careful. Um, one other consideration with negative conditioning is what's called the Garcia effect. So this is not when you have a bunch of deadheads who come and take over your park, but it actually refers to the links between specific stimuli and responses. So to, managing, to manage food conditioning, animals would need to learn that the food is associated with a negative consequence. And this can be done as shown on the left-hand side when the, the food that's of concern is paired with a substance that makes them nauseous. And then when they encounter that food again, they'll learn to avoid it. And this is pretty, um, this is pretty automatic for mammals. This is why, for example, I can't eat hot and sour soup because I one time happened to have it when I had the flu. So now every, every time I smell hot and sour soup, it makes me feel sick. But if you use this, there are things you can put in food to sort of train animals this way, but it only works for the food the animal's trained on. And so it would be really difficult and starts to get ethically questionable if you're trying to train or condition an animal to avoid all human foods they might encounter. And then to manage, um, to manage habituation, animals can learn to associate sounds like hearing people with pain or negative consequences, but this won't break that taste pathway. This is why aversive conditioning used on a food condition animal just doesn't work. That's the right hand side here and why there's that sort of X in the middle. You can't cross over the stimulus and learning. Um, the food reward is stronger than the pain stimulus a manager is likely to administer and the pain stimulus just doesn't break that pathway. A final consideration is individual animal characteristics. And as I mentioned earlier, learning happens at that individual level. You have to find the individual that's habituated or food conditioned. You can't just remove any individual if you're having problems with a, a bear that's breaking into cars or things like that. Um, and researchers are now acknowledging the role of individual animal temperament with the recognition that like people, an individual animal may be at the more bold or shy end of the spectrum of population. And that can affect how they respond to stimuli and learn. And you also need to consider that individual animal's history of exposure to various stimuli as well as social learning. So we know that mother bears tend, can, can teach their cubs to rely on human food. So basically when you encounter a bear, you don't know if you're count, encountering one that's more like Mary Poppins or Charles Manson. And so which one you're encountering would really affect the appropriate strategy to try to use to shape that bear's behavior. So as we were compiling what we learned from animal behavior, we really noted that the strategies directed to animals tended to be more reactive when they were already displaying some undesired behavior from those interactions with people. And there were also some significant limitations to what we could do since we're trying to conserve these species and also how effective they might be given some of those trade-offs that we just talked about. So as we were thinking about the kinds of proactive or prevention techniques that are available, we noted that most of these were focused on managing human behavior either to physically keep people and animals apart or to affect the way that people interact with wildlife in spaces where you don't have those physical barriers. And then we also noted that the techniques to manage human behavior would require a very different kind of expertise than wildlife bi biology or animal behavior and should really be based on a range of social sciences. 
So that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk. Conveniently, that fits in with what I did my dissertation work on, the social science side. Um, and we'll talk about the different approaches to manage the human behavior that contributes to these human wildlife interactions. But first, I wanted to start with some classic quotes about wildlife management. The first comes from Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife ecology. And this is quoted by the historian who wrote his biography, recognizing that the problem really is about human management. And then the second quote from Fazio and Gilbert, who went a little further to say wildlife management is 90% managing people and only 10% managing the wildlife. So these quotes remind us that most of what we do really is managing the human side of human wildlife interactions. And one of the approaches that many people often turn to is an information or public awareness campaign, relying on the distribution of information and the general assumption that if someone knows more about the issue, they will make better choices. This is often referred to as the information deficit model, since there's this assumption that if all is needed is, is the right information and then the behavior, right behavior will follow. But this has been really repeatedly shown to be untrue in lots and lots of cases. And so as one example, I wanted to share with you one of my experiences. This isn't a great photo, but it shows visitors at Rocky Mountain National Park who are a bit too close for a, to a bull elk in the fall taking pictures. What you can't tell from this picture is that this is a group of wildlife biologists and human dimension specialists who were just at a human dimensions of fish and wildlife management conference and had been talking about habituation and food conditioning. And so we were walking along the trail and we turned around a corner, we're probably less than 30 feet from the elk. And we did stop, but it took us quite a while before some of us, and I wasn't the first one to move back, but someone suggested, you know, maybe we should move back. And this photo was taken after we'd actually moved back and the elk had moved away from us. So we were even closer than this to begin with. So clearly we knew we should have been further away. It wasn't knowledge that was the ultimate determinant of our behavior. There were lots of other things at play besides information. So if people who study this phenomenon and think it's important still don't behave properly, what are the things that we can do to change the behavior of people who might not even start with those same expectations and values? Something else to consider um, is that there are different kinds of objectives for different kinds of communication, where a lot of the skills for education have these implied objectives of increasing awareness and knowledge. Persuasion, there's a whole field of persuasion that really is about how you can change attitudes. Um, and then there's another field called risk communication, which is a little more complicated, but it's about giving lay people information they need to make informed judgments about risk. And then of course, social marketing, which explicitly focuses on behavior change as the desired outcome. So all of these require understanding how people seek and process information and identify trusted sources. Um, but today, since we're talking about behavior, we're gonna focus on social marketing. I wanna first acknowledge that one theory that's often used to examine behavior change is a theory of planned behavior. It's based on cognitive processing where there are many internal psychological factors that affect someone's intention to behave. And while intention can be a good predictor of behavior, it's not always enough as we've seen. Some areas that have been suggested for additions um, are skills and environmental constraints. And another area that people are trying to figure out how to integrate is the role of emotion. Social marketing is a more comprehensive approach that includes these broader considerations, and it uses traditional marketing principles and techniques to increase the uptake of pro-environmental behaviors. So this figure is a nice heuristic to remind ourselves that the common tools that people use, education and law, actually are only useful to people at the tail ends of any population curve. Those who are ready to take the action already and, and really do just need that information, the show me group on the left-hand side, or those who are really unlikely to take the action unless they're forced, the make me group on the right hand side. But the vast majority tend to fall in the middle, this help me segment, where they need some help knowing what to do, how to do it, and why it's beneficial to them. So some core concepts in social marketing are that it draws from a number of social science fields, focuses on targeting specific behaviors, and then uses theory and formative research to design the communication approach. And you sometimes hear about the four P's of marketing and how those are applied to behavior with the product in this case being the behavior itself, the price being the barriers to engage in the behavior, then there's the place where the behavior takes place and then all of community communication strategies that are used to promote that behavior. Some important core principles are first and foremost to keep in mind the audience and identifying what's in it for them. Why would they wanna engage in that behavior? 
some things to think about that increase the likelihood are offering a, what's called a superior replacement behavior, coming up with something that meets their needs in an improved way. It's easy to do and it's socially desirable. And a shorthand way to remember this is to make the behavior fun, easy, and popular, which is actually the name of a blog that shares tips about behavior change. Another core communication strategy is to make the messages consistent and ubiquitous so that people are hearing them all the time in the same way. Social marketing is a relatively new strategy in conservation, and this graph shows in green the number of conservation articles published in the longest running social marketing journal. So you can see it's pretty sparse and it's sort of just starting to, to increase. And the author of the study, Diego Verissimo, is one of the leaders who's established a conservation marketing, marketing working group for the Society of Conservation Biology. And they actually recently just held their second ever conservation marketing conference. Some other professionals who have started to offer trainings and resources targeting conservation include Doug Mackenzie Moore, Nancy Lee, and Brooke Tully. And then of course, uh, Grace, you mentioned RARE, which I, I forgot to put in here too, but that would be another group. Um, and then today I'm gonna use the framework developed by Doug Mackenzie Moore to illustrate some of the more important elements of social marketing um, and then illustrate that through a case study. The first step is to select behaviors. And this sounds easy, but it's actually important to think through what might be actually be a complex behavior chain to, to get to what Mackenzie Moore called the non-divisible end state behaviors, the ones that are essential to seeing the behavior that you want. And so there should also be an analysis of which behaviors are most impactful, which have the higher probability of adoption, and which will reach the most people who aren't doing it already. So to illustrate that first concept, what we typically think of as the behavior that we wanna affect is often actually a suite of behavior that may really be that chain of behaviors that you need to divide out to get to that, that one that matters in the end. So just for keeping a clean campsite, it involves at least two major chains of behaviors, properly disposing of trash and properly securing food. And each of those requires a number of steps to do it properly. So collecting the food or trash, putting it in the receptacle and securing it, and then even if you do all those other steps correctly, if you don't secure the containers properly, then all your efforts are for naught because the wildlife can still get into the food and get that food reward and learn to be attracted to that area. So as we go through the steps, I'm gonna illustrate them with a case study based on that sort of chain of behaviors related to keeping a clean campground, which comes from um, a kind of fun story that originated with Keith Benson from Redwoods uh, National and State Parks. And he stopped me at the end of a conference. We were literally about to go out to our cars and going home, but he had a couple questions about a social marketing uh, talk that I had just given when I was just starting to explore this idea. And so I gave him some basics of things to look for, the type of social scientist you might wanna work with, and then we kind of went our separate ways. Uh, and then a number of years later, he sent me this campaign information that their parks have put together, and we have since presented it as a workshop at a workshop at a conference on parks and protected areas management. We wrote it up in a journal article, and it's now going to be a case study with Nancy Lee's upcoming new book, which is pretty cool. So this case study is about the marbled murrelet, which is an endangered species, and it turns out that redwoods is an important breeding ground, and this is their um, winter plumage. For a long time, people didn't know where marble murrelets nested. And so during the breeding season, their plumage changes to be more cryptic, but people didn't really know where they went. And it was only discovered in the 1970s that marble murrelets nest high in the redwoods. And so this sequence gives you a sense of the scale of the nest. So here's a close up on the nest. It's really high up in the trees. And scaling back, you can see how high in the canopy they are and why it was difficult to find them for so long. And so it turns out that they were suffering from nest predation and the nest cameras identified that the main culprits were stellars, jays, and crows. And jays and crows um, are not only a major source of nest predation, but they also are found in higher concentrations near campgrounds in redwoods. And so not addressing this issue could have led the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to issue findings of take and shut down those campgrounds if the park didn't do anything. And so that's how the park decided to focus on the human behavior the suite of behaviors related to keeping a clean campground so that jays and crows didn't get access to the human food. So now that we have the behavior selected, we need to identify what's keeping the animals from, um, keeping the, sorry, the people <laughs> from engaging in the behavior and what will motivate them to act. So barriers uh, or, and benefits, the drivers can be both internal to an individual 
So for example, knowing how to identify which of these snakes is poisonous or how to access that information in the moment of seeing a snake or a glimpse of a snake. Um, on the other hand, they also can originate outside the individual. Um, how do you make that behavior more convenient or affordable? So in this photo, people were trying to do the right thing. They piled their trash together, but there wasn't a receptacle to keep it from the wildlife. So this is that make it easy part. Back to our case study at Redwoods. Um, the team worked with a suite of um, social science research. They hired some social scientists to do a survey of researchers, um, conduct observations on visitor behavior and do some content analysis on existing interpretive materials based on through, like, through this lens of social marketing. And they found that most of the feeding was actually accidental. It wasn't intentional, that people wanted to know what to do and that the interpretive messages were just too complex and too confusing. So the next step is to take that information um, about the audiences and to develop a strategy. And so here you'll need to know whether you're trying to encourage or discourage um, a certain behavior and then develop strategies that are targeted to those identified benefits and barriers. For the behavior we wish to promote, securing food and trash, we wanna reduce its barriers while simultaneously increasing the benefits as shown by the arrows here. So in contrast, we want to do the opposite for the behavior we wish to discourage, leaving those tra the trash unsecured. We want to instead increase the barriers to doing that while also reducing the benefits. Um, and so there are a variety of behavior change tools that can assist with these different tasks. And then I'll walk through each of these briefly. Um, but one thing that's important to note is that you should really be applying these strategically based on that analysis of the context of the problem um, and the audience is not just sort of knowing, hey, here's a laundry list and I'm just gonna pick and choose, but really target how they're being used to address the specifics of your situation. The first tool is commitments where people who have committed to a small behavior change are much more likely to agree to a larger request. And this works for two reasons. First is that a small request can alter the way that people perceive themselves. And second, that we have a strong desire to be seen as consistent by others. So in this case, at Point Reyes National Seashore, as shown in the photos, when rangers saw people with dogs off leash, they gave them some dog treats and a leash that said, I love walking on a leash at Point Reyes. So by accepting the leash, they've committed to having the tool, and then it would make them inconsistent if they have the leash, but they don't use it. Prompts are visual or auditory aids that remind us to carry out an activity that we might otherwise forget. So an example is this sign on the food storage locker reminding people to store their food properly. Um, prompts should be noticeable, self-explanatory, in close proximity to where the behavior happens, and focus on what you want people to do, not what you want them not to do, because you never know what behavior people will come up with to replace that behavior with. Norms are standards of proper or acceptable behavior, and they tell us what we should do. And so this was tested at Petrified Forest National Park, um, looking at normative messages and how those affected theft of petrified wood. So in the first treatment, they stated what people had done and the negative effects that it had on the resources. There was a control with no messaging and then a statement that told people what they should do and why. And so as you can see in the graph here, they found that the first treatment actually led to higher theft than no message at all. And it's because they use what's called a descriptive norm, showing that most people take wood even though it has detrimental consequences. And then a sec whoops, the second, um, message used what's called an injunctive norm that you shouldn't remove the wood and that was more effective. And this is a variation on a classic study on littering that has demonstrated over and over again that when presented with both types of information, people are more likely to follow a descriptive norm than an injunctive norm. So you want to be careful of creating those mixed messages and really just focus on the injunctive norm, what you want people to do. Most programs include a communication component um, the impact of communications on behavior can really vary dramatically based on how the communications are developed. So to develop effective communications, you wanna make sure that you know your audience, use a credible source, carefully consider use of threatening messages to people that only have so much emotional space for worry, make your messages easy to remember and captivating. And so this picture here is a preview of the campaign that was developed based on all of these considerations. Agencies are often limited in the incentives that we can provide, but we do have the possibility of disincentives. And so it's important to remember that um, if you do use fines, the fine in and of itself isn't enough to motivate behavior. They also need to be paired with some likelihood of getting caught as shown here, or it's a meaningless threat. 
So if you use fines, you need to be prepared to enforce them at least enough so that people really think that, that it's a true disincentive. And then of course the behavior straight change strategies you've seen so far can be very effective, but they won't work at all if there are significant external barriers. So in these examples, infrastructure like this recycling bin for monofilament fishing line or these trash bag dispensers can be provided to make the behavior easier to do. So remember back to the findings from our case study, it turns out that some of the major barriers were actually created by the Park Service. The messages were great pieces of interpretation, but they weren't really clear enough with respect to what people needed to do. And one aha moment that we had when we were kind of talking about this case was that neither the interpreters nor the wildlife biologists or really law enforcement staff are trained in producing the kind of coordinated social marketing messaging, which is what people needed. So the Redwoods team used the advice from the social science group to come up with a new strategy based on some of these really gr great principles. Don't bury the lead, tell people what to do, model the behavior and make sure that message is consistent and ubiquitous. And so what this looks like, looked like um, many of the tools that we just discussed were used, including a commitment via a sticker that says I'm crumb clean that people can wear showing their commitment, using that logo that shows the norm of the desired behavior, consistent communication, multiple media channels, including a video that you have to watch to be able to reserve a campsite, fines for campsites that weren't crumb clean, and then providing the infrastructure to make those behaviors convenient. Finally, you need to think about managing success, which um, Jenna just brought up towards the end of the last talk. But in this case, um, you know, for human behavior, it's really important to recognize when that human behavior metric is an intermediate step towards resource protection. And it can be difficult to measure the effectiveness of your behavior campaign where you really would wanna measure the human behavior that's um, expressed. You can also measure whether the human behavior was the right target um, by measuring resource response. And that's what this team did. So because the case study was related to take under the Endangered Species Act, they focused on the behavior of the sellers jays. And so the last two data points on this graph show that from the first two years when they started the campaign where they were just piloting, they st were starting to see effects in the campground. And it wasn't yet statistically significant, but it was enough for them to broaden the campaign to many other units at Redwoods. And it's been running since then, since 2013, and they now have this comprehensive web page for the campaign that really explains a lot of these ideas, not in the social science jargon, but in the terms that's more accessible for the public. And then they've also been evaluating, and so this is a recent study that just came out um, this year, of seven picnic areas in Big Basin Redwood State Park, where they looked at the three years pre-management and the three years post-treatment, and they showed a significantly lower amount of anthropogenic food in the Jays' diets. And they also saw less overlap in Jay home ranges and lower densities of Jays in the subsidized areas, the, camp, the picnic areas. So this is a great example of how you can demonstrate that link between successful campaigns to affect human behavior, having that desired effect on the wildlife behavior. Just um, quickly, I wanted to share a couple more things. Um, many of you have probably seen the Park Service Long Distance Relationship Campaign, which was developed with my co-authors. And we've put related content about animal behavior and human behavior um, on the Wildlife Watching Subject site. And in the section on what we do, the campaign materials are available there for people to use and modify. And then there's also additional background material that Katie Abrams put together for us at that WordPress site the second link at the bottom of the slide. And then of course you heard from Grace all those great materials that the Office of Marine Sanctuaries has put together. And then really quickly, I just wanna just show you some exciting new research that we're continuing to work on. Sarah and Katie are doing another project related to expanding these principles to wildlife feeding. And then I'm working with Katie to extend the wildlife viewing learnings um, to marine species. And so this is some of the work that we just did looking at messaging to help people keep their distance from basking turtles, which some of you may have seen presented at that recent conservation marketing conference. Um, but essentially we realized that um, visitors were getting these competing messages from tour operators who were trying to entice them to have exactly the types of encounters that we want to discourage. <laughs> Educators who were providing a lot of interesting information about turtles to increase their interest and care about the turtles. And then law enforcement who need to legally provide the rules and regulations so they can be enforced, but often do so in a very cursory kind of way. And so we wanted to figure out how we bring these different objectives together in a cohesive sort of social marketing package that's beneficial to everyone. 
So drawing on the previous research that had been done, Katie and her team developed a campaign to make that desired behavior clear and aligned with visitors' expectations. They can still have an amazing experience even if they're viewing from afar. And then that aligns with their identity as a respectful person and is easy to do through this infographic that helps people judge distances and role models the desired behavior that you want to see. They also capitalized on exchange theory by offering a replacement behavior of taking simple but more fun forced perspective photos. So that makes people keep the right distance without telling them they have to do it. And so this is that idea of providing a superior replacement behavior that meets their needs for that Instagrammable photo. They also recognize that tour operators were really essential to broadening the reach of this messaging because a lot of the visitors are not coming through agencies. So any of the material that we provide for um, tour operators to help disseminate really shouldn't duplicate or rep replace their expertise and it really has to add value to their operation. So they also made sure they provided a, a Japanese translation since that's the largest international market and tried to make it attractive and have these like stickers, you know, sea turtle supporters and things that can be a good reminder of their visit. Um, just to show you what their experiment looked like, they had three conditions, the control existing conditions, which had those regulatory signs up on poles, the same regulatory signs placed on the beach, and then the newly designed signs placed on the beach. And we needed that middle option um, because we realized that just having a temporary sign in a new location could affect the behavior. And that's actually what we saw. Um, in fact, the regulatory signs on the beach increased compliance from the control um, but the signs that were designed using those social marketing principles had an even greater effect. And this was even in the midst of this data, this um, research was taking place right as all of COVID was starting to happen. The, the experimental design phase was right as things were all changing very rapidly, but they did get enough data to show a change and they're, that's why they're hoping to replicate it soon. So they're just about to head out in the field uh, in the next week or two um, for an extended period. And they're going to test messages um, expanding from sea turtles to other marine species and then replicating this study again in another location. So we should have another set of research to add to our collection of knowledge on this topic soon. And then just um, one final slide. This leads me to an opportunity that we're really looking into that Grace kind of foreshadowed a little bit. But we want to think about how we can consolidate all this great information that we've been learning over the years into a guidebook or a contributed paper for the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council. And this is um, the IVUMC is a coordinated effort among six federal agencies to improve visitor management, visitor use management on public lands. And so we've kind of introduced the idea and they're really supportive and, ex and excited. Um, and that actually grew out of some of the discussions that we had planning for this symposium here about how we had this, this wealth of messaging and IVUMC would be a great place to, to get that out there. And so having all of these agencies drawing on similar guidance and language would ensure that visitors can really receive that consistent and ubiquitous messaging about their behavior around wildlife, regardless of the lands and waters that they visit. And so even though this research started with the Park Service and NOAA, we'd really love to have partners as we develop this um, from other organizations and coordinate with the Respect Wildlife Campaign, especially as you test and refine approaches too. So please uh, let me know if you'd be interested in joining us as we try to think about how we can best pull together this set of resources for the broader community. And with that, um, here's my contact information, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And hopefully we have still some time. I know we started a little late, but I tried to not even to know too much. So I'll stop sharing my screen here. Thank you. Turn it back to you. Was, I was riveted on every slide. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm sure we must have some questions from attendees. And keep an eye on the chat too, Kirsten, because I'm you're gonna start to get some props, I think, from the from the audience. Yeah, there's some great sharing going on. Nicole Turner shared um, some tips and some links to be whale wise and some different resources. So check those out. And um, also Nicole, if you could post those on our uh, Padlet, that would be great because that'll stay active. Request uh, for Kirsten to share her contact info in the chat because uh, they missed it. Okay. And again, that should go out with the, the abstracts as well. Irina says that she misses you at the National Park Service. <laughs> it's great. Well, I, I definitely catch myself slipping into 
we at the National Park Service, I'm like, wait, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> I don't want to hog the platform, but I have tons of questions. Um, sure. So the first question I have, you kind of mentioned how there's an eval there was an evaluation that went on with the, the sea turtle um, signage and how the, I think the the social marketing based signage went out just at the start of COVID. I think that's what you said. Hmm. And so did the, the, the evaluation was, so there's been some, some at least perceived changes in people's attitudes and use of outdoor spaces. And so I'm just kind of curious, I, I think the next evaluation maybe will will pick up more on that or, or if you could just speak to that. Yeah. So a couple things that's a, those are great questions. And it was, that whole project, it was funny because we were also dealing with like weather that was keeping people from going to the beach and the sea turtles weren't there. We're like, we need days that they're both sea turtles and people. Um, and so the COVID didn't really start happening until we were in the third stage. So um, things were fine during the control, both the control of the regulatory signs and then the moving the regulatory signs onto the beach. And then it was just like partway through testing the new signs that we started to hear about closures are going to happen. Travel's going to become restricted. People might need to go home. But we already knew there were a lot of visitors who were here and couldn't leave yet or probably weren't going to leave yet, you know. Um, so we felt like we probably had enough people and sh we did at least have high enough numbers of people. But we felt like if anything, we probably had fewer people than we would have otherwise. Um, and they may have been thinking more about keeping their distance because of the social distancing messaging that was starting to bubble up. So that's why we want to retest that part. Um, but we were pretty excited that we did see a significant difference, even given those considerations. And this is one to answer your earlier question about evaluation. This is one that we were using human behavior to evaluate. So it was how many people were staying that distance. And so what Katie would do is she and her team would just sit on the beach as if they were visitors and they would just observe and they would see how many people came and got too close to the turtles, how many stayed within the appropriate distance. And they use little things like they'd put leaves out so they could see what 10 feet, what a 10 foot distance was and be able to judge that themselves from when they were observing. So they actually were able to use the, the distance, the, the behavior they wanted to see as the me measure of success in that case. And Katie's a graduate student, correct? She's a professor at the okay. Department of Journalism and Communications okay, at good. Colorado State University. Well, and so we- Handy. <laughs> what was that? We should all have one of those handy for our projects. Well, yeah, and you know, for the um, Crumb Clean campaign, they worked with um, social scientists at uh, Humboldt State University who really specialized in this kind of work too. And it was really one of those things where, I mean, literally Keith and I had like a 10 minute conversation in the parking lot. I'm like, this is the kind of person you want to ask for. This is the kind of skills. And then he came back and he's like, Oh yeah, we, we hired this person and this is what we did. I, I think it's kind of cool. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. So I think it's also sort of looking around at the, the researchers that you have in the universities nearby, looking in the communication departments, um, looking for people who are really sometimes in the social science departments, psychology, there's a lot of conservation psychology kinds of people. Doug McKenzie Moore, that's his background is social psychology, conservation psychology. And that's one thing that his trainings are very heavy in is the psychology theory behind things too. So, yeah. And you I know, see people are adding the, the links for Katie, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. We have a question uh, from Paul. He says, can you talk a bit about the marble mirrorlet wrap video and speak to its effectiveness? The wrap one, I haven't, um, I don't know if they've tested that one in particular, but they, they have another one which is the sort of the basics that you have to know uh, when you reserve a campsite. So that was the one that I was referring to in my talk that um, when you go to reserve a camp, campsite, you, you know, have to go through this online reservation program. And before it will let you reserve it, you have to watch this video that talks about crumb clean, how you do it and shows people literally, you know, the behavior, how to do the behaviors. So how to, how to find a food storage locker, what it looks like, how to open it, you know, how to put your hand in the latch because a lot of people get stuck with that. They don't know how to open it and closing it securely. Same with the trash cans and even how to wash your dishes. This was another one there that they found that a lot of the birds were getting food in the drains. And so taking the scraps off of your dishes before you wash them and throwing those away. And then they also installed the, the covers over the drain so that the birds couldn't get into that food. So 
Those Thank are you. some of the things with that. Yeah. Another question we have is, let's see, just pull it away from me. Any strategies and principles you talked about applicable across environmental issues, for example, wildlife disturbance, poaching, littering, making more sustainable choices to help limit climate change, pollution, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And it, they pretty much are. I mean, anytime that you're, what you're actually trying to do is affect the behavior, then you can refer back to these principles. The actual strategy that you use will be tailored a little, a little differently depending on what that behavior is and what the motivations are. Um, poaching can be a little tricky because people are likely to not tell you about that. So, you know, doing the audience research to find out what are the drivers can be a little bit more challenging with some of those. Um, but littering, there's been a ton of work on littering. That's where the petrified forest example was actually broadening littering, but there's like a, a ton of it on that. Um, and marine debris, things like that, they would all be applicable. Yeah. Another question from Kathleen. She asks, any strategies to assess visitor readiness for specific types of messaging? Hmm. I mean, so this is where the social oh. science, different kinds of social science methods where you can do surveys or interviews, things where you actually talk to the target audience and the observations. So um, pairing it with you know, really asking people, you can pilot test things, um, try a few different things and see which ones resonate best with people, pilot test your messages. But having that foundational work where you really ask people, um, you can get a sense of what is their existing knowledge, what kinds of things do they find acceptable or easy to understand, or just what are things that are just really way too, too far out there for them. And that gives you a real, really good idea of where they're starting from and then what kinds of potential strategies might fit in appropriately. Thank you. Um, yeah. Nicole is asking, and do you see any fatigue in visitors that might not want to participate in desired behavior because they feel like their single actions won't make a difference in the grand scheme of environmental crisis things? Yeah, that's a huge challenge. I think that's especially when you kind of lead with doom and gloom messaging and, and you're asking people to do the right thing and it's not easy to do. And so that's part of why with the social marketing strategy, it's all about thinking about like, where are they coming from? Like, oh no, it's one more thing I have to do. And so you really have to help make it easy. You know, make that, have those trash receptacles right there um, and not have people look around. If they have to look around for too long, they're just gonna throw it on the ground. And then also making sure that the area is clean because going back to that littering piece, if it looks like other people are doing it, I'm not gonna make a difference, then they probably will just throw it on the ground. But if your staff is going around also keeping the place clean, if people see a clean area, then they're less likely to litter too. So tapping into those psychology pieces to help reduce that fatigue for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Colleen is asking, do you have any ideas about new or unique funding sources for this type of work? Mm, that's a great question. <laughs> um, being creative, I think, because that is one of the things that we've had challenges with. And actually, Sarah and I were just talking about this as we were talking about putting together resources because often from developing communication strategies, one of the things that we are frustrated with is that when you look for funding for that, there's never funding for the front end audience research, which is really, um, the campaigns are much stronger when you have that audience research. There's often not much for evaluation either, which is a separate issue. But then we also often have other research that when people manage to get it funded for social science, the end of their presentations are like, and then someone can use this for audience research for education, but they, those are not necessarily connected. So if there are ways we can think about how do we connect those efforts so that the work that's being done by social scientists is really informing the kind of information we need about the audiences for those communication pieces, I think that's a way that we can be a little more efficient. I've seen some more things popping up, but I haven't been able to follow them all. <laughs> um, I see. think that's all the questions I see. There's some great comments and lots of kudos for sure. Great, thanks. Yes, and getting Reserve America on board. And so that's the idea of like, as much as we can get these shared tips and tricks out to the central location that everybody can look at, if we're all kind of drawing from that same core set of things, then we can help 
I'll be reinforcing each other's messages. So you're not getting something different in California state parks or national parks or in sanctuaries, you know? Yeah. Yeah, this was exactly the principle behind the Respect Wildlife campaign only within California, but I think it's pretty clear that it can be expanded beyond <laughs> the boundaries of this state. No, I think so. And I think that that's great to have that set of resources and you know, we have with Sarah and with um, Grace, these the possibility of reaching these agencies at a higher level. And if we can get a few other agencies on board, I think we really have a pretty big reach. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions, questions for Kirsten? You can also pop uh, questions in from any of the talks or any discussion points uh, that you'd like to bring up. This is our time um, for sort of synthesizing that if you have any thoughts. Um, and don't go away just yet because we have a couple things coming up. Um, while we're waiting for any um, questions, any more questions to come up, I just wanted to let you guys know if you are not planning to attend the workshop section tomorrow, and I, I do dearly hope that you will attend because it's gonna be so fun as we alluded to earlier, um, fun and useful. Um, if you're not, then go ahead and take our user, our evaluation survey, and I'm gonna go ahead and pop that into the chat. Oh, that's not the right link. I copied the wrong link. Um, so this will just help us uh, get engage your um, your sense of how well the uh, this workshop worked for you. If you're going to be around tomorrow for the workshops, then you can do it at the end of the day. Then, okay, let's see if this is right. There we go. Um, yeah, so check that check that survey out and give us some feedback so we can make this as good as it can be. I think we might have another question there, Cara. We do, yes. Uh, Nicole Palmas asking, is this field of social marketing and wildlife slash environmental issues a pretty narrow field? What are your recommendations for anyone looking to get where you are, actually doing the research and creating messages? That's a great question. Um, it's, it is a little bit narrow. I mean, if you're really, really focused on the messaging side of things, um, and I came to it through, you know, starting with a foundation in the wildlife ecology for my um, master's, and then I did the PhD in human dimensions. And human dimensions, sort of broadly speaking, um, is, my, is my microphone coming in and out? Can you hear me okay? You're good. It's just flickering. Um, but, and then within, within human dimensions, there's a whole range of social sciences, and this is one specialization within that. Um, I guess it depends if your goal is to work with an agency. In agencies, there are not very many social science positions. And so you tend to need to be a generalist and have enough experience with the whole, a broad range of social sciences that you can connect with the right researchers in universities. So I have just enough to know, just not to be dangerous, just enough to know to find Katie and other people like that to really bring in and do the research. And if you wanna do that research as your primary thing, then you may be better off working at a university where you can where you're expected to specialize in a really clear um, theoretical area. And so you might want to. Um, so those are kind of, I guess, the two different approaches to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Nicole Turner posted that uh, UC San Diego has an online graduate certificate in sustainability and behavior change. And she provided the link through their extension courses. Looks interesting. I clicked it. And, Devin and then is she does have a, a newsletter. So I know that I get his newsletter and that shows um, workshops and symposia and conferences and mm -hmm. things that are coming up. Plus includes, he had a whole recent series about social norms um, that was really, really interesting. Can you share yeah. that? I'll see if I can find where, I don't remember where I signed, <laughs> signed up, but I'll see, I'll put it on Padlet if I can find it. So the ones that were um, in the beginning of the framework that I mentioned, I'll see if I can pull them here, but Doug McKenzie Moore, um, Nancy Lee, and Brooke Tully all run trainings fairly frequently for, um, 
for practitioners. And then I think rare also, but I didn't have a rare link in there. So maybe, maybe Grace, you can find that one. <laughs> um, let's see. Ooh. Um, Nicole Turner says she's dropped the link to Doug McKenzie's Moore's book in the Padlet. It's available free online. And he also has a whole um, group of case studies and they're sort of organized by different topics. And so there are a lot in social, in social marketing in general, there's a lot of examples from public health and from like, from the natural resource side, it's often like water conservation, energy conservation, things like that. But they're starting to get more in the natural resource, uh, the type of natural resources we talk about. <laughs> okay. okay. Um looks like Nicole Turner seems are they're moving it to the Padlet. So that's great. Okay. So these links and resources will be in both places. And then I see there's also some general human dimensions resources going into like HDGov and that's a, a great clearinghouse for sort of the whole range of things. Again, social marketing being one very specific aspect, um, but there's a whole range of other things that we need to think about with respect to other ways that people engage with wildlife and um, management. Just a reminder too that our Padlet will stay up after this symposium is over. So it'll, it'll stay up forever. <laughs> um, and you can access all of the uh, information that gets put up there. There'll be more going up later today, I'm sure, and more tomorrow during the workshop. So. Um, use that as a resource um, continually to, to access this information. What a great way to end the day. Thank you, Kristen. That was amazing. That just wrapped it all up in a nice package with the <laughs> Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah.